Welcome, everyone. Um, I think it's a good thing if people are standing, actually. Like, for me, this feels good. You know, it seems that there, there's a lot of interest, at least. Um, yeah, I apologize already for the first error on the slides. Uh, of course, today is August 7th. But I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about this one. Um, all right, so, um, yeah, I'll talk about internet scanning just before we get started. Just a brief introduction here. Um, I think this slide is a little bit funny because the, the Twitter handle over like the last th two, three years moved up in this list. Like it used to be down there or maybe at the end of the presentation. And nowadays it's just so important, you've got to have it on the top. But anyway, um, so I'm a security researcher at Rapid7, um, more concretely, more specifically in the labs team. And the labs team, uh, yeah, focuses on research and proof of concept development. So we're trying to help out internal product teams, but also doing, you know, a lot of research and development for the community, you know, pushing open source projects, trying to, um, yeah, improve, improve uh, our tools and, and give you guys something to work with. Um, just apart from that, I'm also a developer for Cuckoo Sandbox. I hope that some of you have heard of it or maybe used it for some malware analysis, uh, some incident response purposes. So if you have any questions about that, um, feel free to come to me afterwards. Um, my background is a little bit more research on botnets, malware, so reverse engineering. My first talk was on uh, the Stormworm botnet in 2008. So that's where I a little bit come from. This project's pretty much different, but it's a lot of fun, and I hope I can, uh, yeah, deliver that message to you. Uh, there are lots of other smaller side projects. If you're interested in, in Android uh, security, then you might want to check out Dexlabs.org, which is one of my projects um, from last year. Uh, honeypots, uh, you know, developing new data sharing protocols, all sorts of side stuff. All right. So today, um, I want to give a quick recap about internet scanning, like, you know, who's doing it, um, what the purpose for different people is, um, what kind of our motivation is, um, and, and our project, our label basically is called Project Sonar, so I'm giving you a bit of information about that, what it is, what it means, how you can participate, how you can leverage the data or the stuff that we're doing. Um, and yeah, and we have, we do research on our own data, we do research on the stuff that uh, we find out on the internet, and of course I'm, uh, you know, going to tell you a little bit about the findings. There's some good stuff, I think, lined up. Um, some vulnerabilities and some problems that we found are still in the close disclosure process, so I, I won't be able to go into, you know, the exact detail, but, you know, in a couple of weeks, months, um, it's definitely disclosed. So. Yeah, we'll go into a little bit of a use case at the end. Uh, if we have time, this is going to be a pretty tight schedule uh, for 25 minutes. But I'll try to make it quick and not too quick, hopefully. All right, so what, we're, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, large-scale data gathering, scanning, um, internet-wide, basically. So reaching every IPv4 IP address, we're actually in the process of also getting our hands on some data about IPv6 and, you know, the services that are available in IPv6. But as most of you know, uh, you know, the classical internet scanning and just enumerating all IP addresses definitely won't work for IPv6. So we have to take a little bit different approach there. Um, so the history of this is, yeah, quite long. Um, the first internet scanning and reaching every IP address project sort of um, with, that, with that outline, with that goal, started in, yeah, 80, 98 plus some, something around maybe 2000, I guess. They tried to, uh, with the internet mapping project and also the IPv4 census, they wanted to see how the allocation of IP addresses, you know, is, is processing, uh, uh, progressing, and see, uh, you know, how much of the net blocks are in use, how many systems are online. And then um, there were some interesting other projects. Um, the EFF SSL Observatory, I think 2014 is definitely wrong. I think it's 2010, I think, when it was. But it's still uh, ongoing to a certain extent. I mean, the researchers are still there working on the data, but at least it was a three-month project, I think, and they gathered all available SSL certificates on the internet and all, all things in use, and they were able to show that there are, um, you know, misconfigurations, problems with certificate authorities, broken certificates, you know, du duplicate name usage uh, around the globe. So it was really definitely interesting. And um, they shared their data set in raw for researchers to work on. And that was really awesome because, you know, everybody could take a look, verify their uh, assumptions, their findings. The Internet Census 2012 was pretty funny. Uh, I think, you know, some of you will remember this one. Um, basically, there was a researcher taking over, I think, between 100,000 and 400,000 uh, embedded devices or other, other systems 
by basically just trying default passwords or trying, you know, guessing a few passwords. He was able to compromise like, you know, 100K plus machines, but he didn't use it for Bitcoin mining as everybody does nowadays. He just used it for actually performing a scan on, you know, a really high amount of ports on the whole internet. And they published this data, I think it was a torrent, um, and you could download like the unzipped nine terabytes of collected data that they have had. So it was really interesting. Of course, illegal approach. I mean, compromising devices and using them for your own purpose is of course uh, not legal. But um, nowadays we're actually able to replicate some of that in a, in a legal way and you know, in a, in a way that is sustainable and doesn't require this, this sort of practice. Shodan, most of you will know it. Um, internet search engine, you know, you search for banners, uh, HTTP headers, something, and you will find all the systems that expose or show that particular um, thing. So Ripe Atlas is slightly different. They spread around like thousands of nodes across the globe and measure uh, timings and bandwidth, uh, not bandwidth actually, but timings, round trip times uh, between those nodes. Uh, a couple of other ones. So um, Critical IO was actually the project kind of the predecessor to what we're doing within Rapid7 today and within the labs team. And uh, yeah, basically also try to go out there and see what is necessary, how good does it work to gather data, gather banners and information on the whole internet, uh, you know, a couple of different ports and do it over the course of maybe half a year. So University of Michigan is a, is a big player nowadays. Um, they are um, basically responsible for some of the new tool, tools that are released. Um, they released an internet scanning tool, basically the NMAP for like internet wide uh, data gathering. It's not really a competitor of NMAP, it just serves a different purpose. And this is also something that we use in our project. Shadow Server does something, you might have heard of their um, yeah, publications, their, in, their research pages for open recursors, NTP uh, servers that are vulnerable to the monolist uh, thing that was uh, used for denial of service recently. Okay, a couple of other ones, and then you know, there's us with our project Sonar. So just a little bit of the history, because for us, this has already proven to be very interesting, very um, yeah, useful for research. Um, we found in, I believe it was beginning of, beginning of the year, no, beginning of last year, right? Um, the uh, UPnP problems, UPnP vulnerabilities. So this was uh, spearheaded by H.D. Moore, and he basically found, looked at like the internet and his scanning data, and he saw that UPnP is even more widespread than HTTP, you know, more, more UPnP exposing devices than uh, web servers. And he looked at it, and it turns out that three of the major software stacks ma making up over 60% of the whole device uh, range are vulnerable, and they are, you know, compromisable, buffer overflows, that sort of thing, so you could just um, remotely get code execution on those devices. So this was very, like, very good finding. Um, lots of people um, started worrying more about that stuff, looked at UPnP, more research was done, and hopefully you know, we were able to fix a couple of hundred thousand devices maybe, or at least lock them down maybe um, by raising awareness. IPMI was similar. Uh, in IPMI, it's a, it's a server management protocol. It's used to, you know, if you buy like a 19-inch rack server, then sometimes it comes with this server management protocol. You can use it to reboot the server, um, you know, I don't know, reconfigure uh, the, the system, reconfigure the whole uh, hardware, basically. And it had a really nice vulnerability or like a kind of a misdesign. Um, it used authentication and encryption to protect like the, the, the login to this uh, and you could just turn it off essentially. You could use the, the standard tool, tell it to say, you know, encryption, none, and then it would just let you log in if you know a username. You didn't even have to use the right password. So that was pretty funny. Um, of course, not funny if you have thousands of these servers around. You need to patch all that. So yeah, NTP DDoS amplification problems. Um, they're actually used in a big DDoS, I think, earlier this year. Was it last year? Earlier this year, I think. And uh, the problems are known, and they were disclosed and published in 2010 already. So, you know, there was like, hey, guys, this is a huge problem. You know, we need to do something about it. Nothing happens. And then a few years later, you know, there's a big DDoS, and people, you know, start actually worrying about this. Then there's open recursors, open SMTP relays, you know, spam uh, sources, elastic search instances. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, but there's basically a lot of stuff out there that is misconfigured, has problems, has vulnerabilities, is unpatched, or people just don't realize what it actually is that they put on the, on the internet. And so this is really what we're trying to you know, point out, raise awareness about, and actually collect data on. Uh, yeah, Mining P's and Q's was a very good paper. I can recommend reading that from the University of Michigan, I think incorporated in cooperation with UCSD, um, that there are a lot of weak keys used in SSL for SSL communication 
they found that like 50, 60,000 of certificates actually shared like one of the prime factors in their public key, which makes them, uh, yeah, vulnerable. So this is one nice picture that one of my colleagues found, which kind of describes and sums up this whole situation. It's like, a, you know, it's a, it's a crazy environment out there. You will find lots of problematic, misconfigured stuff, stuff that you don't understand when you look at it first, like why is this there? What does this, this doesn't make any sense. And I'm going to uh, go over a couple of examples uh, that we showed previously or, or, you know, reported, published recently about. Um, so one thing was, for example, um, SNMP is a protocol also to monitor and manage uh, servers and switches and so on. And it has one feature uh, to list processes, list running processes on a device or on a system. And it was funny because it actually, for some devices, for some configurations, it shows the arguments given to the processes. You would, so you would just go out there on the internet, you know, do SNMP list process command with the public, you know, community string. So it's kind of open to the internet. You don't need to like have a special password or anything. And it would show you stuff like this. So obviously, I mean, there are not like hundreds of thousands of these instances, but people, I think, just in this case, don't realize that this feature is there, right? So they don't pay attention to it. It's just out there and we need to kind of educate people on, on you know, how, how to fix this and that this shouldn't be happening. We shouldn't be able to see this. Um, you know, this goes on and on with other things. One, one thing is um, telnet shells, like if you connect to the telnet port on thousands of devices, they don't even give you a login, uh, you know, a login prompt. They just give you a shell right away. So you just connect, you know, just do telnet IP something and you just are given a prompt and then you can check what user, user you are. Um, same thing happens on some Windows CE telnet services. So you get like Windows C CMD shells, but you get even, you know, you get even root shells on some devices, on some router switches, whatever it is. Um, and this is really, really weird. Like, right, why would it be in there? Is it, you know, intended? Is it just misconfigured? I mean, what is happening to those devices? Like sometimes we didn't really understand what was going on because it doesn't make any sense. Um, so this is what you find when you just Go out there, collect data, just look at it, right? You don't even need to do any reverse engineering or anything. You just find sort of the problems and the vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, telling that other stuff, we found license plate readers and GPRS track, uh, GPS tracking devices. So, you know, there would be like lines and messages coming up, like we, we connect to it and just give us like all the cars driving by at a street, at a highway somewhere. So it's like, you know, you don't really understand what this is. It might not be a security problem. You know, that is up to the actual application or you know, dependent from case to case. But of course, this is, you know, we are curious and, and, and this is weird to us. This, this looks, I don't know, strange. Um, yeah, there was other research that we published on so-called serial port servers, which essentially on one end have a serial port, on the other end, uh, end they have like a network cable, a Wi-Fi antenna, or like a, even 3G uh, slot or SIM card. And you basically connect it to your server rack in your data center or something, and then you can configure it from remotely from home, which is convenient, nice. The problem is um, it's, in a lot of cases, misconfigured. These things have default passwords, and sometimes they don't even ask for a password. They just directly patch you through. So if you connect it to the serial port, the assumption is you're physically there, so you have access to the device, and you also have the author authorization to the device, right? But if this thing passes you through, like without adding some authentication layer, then you're just, yeah, as if you're next to the server. So this is something that we found um, lots of devices that, that are just exposing shells or, or um, you know, configuration interfaces. Here are some examples of that. So like we found some fuel control systems, fuel pumps that would have their configuration interface, uh, you know, public, you just connect to a telnet port or something else and just offers it to you. Uh, traffic light controls, um, IPTV systems. There was a points of sales device from a dry cleaning shop. You know, you could check out who cleans their leather jackets in that shop. I don't know. I mean, this is, you might not, you might say, well, mm, meh, you know, dry cleaning shop, whatever. It's not, you know, it's not a big deal. But I think this is, it's not about the individual case. It's about the overall problem of this, right? I mean, the, the awareness or the, the, I don't know, the knowledge about what it means to connect one of these devices to your local serial port is not there and it's, you know, you need to um, try to uh, educate people on this. All right, so get, let's get back from like the kind of ancient historic stuff like serial ports to something very recent and very, you know, up to date. Um, Elasticsearch is a, is a search server, so to speak. It's like a little bit of a, it's like a database, 
but it's basically used for um, yeah, enabling search functions on forums, on websites, and so on. And uh, this is really interesting because if you if you do like development with Elasticsearch or you have like a, you know a staging server somewhere and it maybe has not you know confidential data and you think you know this is okay you know I just use it from home it's a temporary instance or something you just put it on you know a Amazon instance or just put it out somewhere and just open and you use it from home now okay the data in there might not be that interesting. But by default, it allowed uh, so-called dynamic scripting, where you could essentially just execute code on the server. I mean, this is a feature of Elasticsearch. So you just upload Java or JavaScript uh, code and just runs it. So essentially, you know, you think you put up a database and you just use it from home or on the public internet. You want to look into the data issue like normal API calls, but it's essentially just a shell, right? I mean, it's just code execution on a public port. So this is something similar, like where you don't really realize what the actual implications of, of this are to put this on a, on a public IP. Um, yeah, it's not the only example. It's the same for MongoDB and other you know, NoSQL, SQL DBs uh, without auth or def default passwords. OK, so this all led up to, you know, this research led up to us um, starting this project called uh, Sonar. And it's basically trying to do this sort of internet data gathering, you know, this large scale data, data gathering on a continuous, um, you know, basis, on an ongoing basis. And we are trying to publish all the data and raise awareness about the problems and find more of these issues, you know, regularly. And not only do a project once, you know, go to a talk, um, I don't know, present some vulnerabilities and then stop, but we want to do this as kind of a community project. We want to, you know, have this ongoing and uh, hopefully for the next years. It's been running now, I think, for like nine months or so. It was announced at DerbyCon in 2013. Okay, so just a quick overview of what is currently in there. Um, we plan to extend this. Well, we started out by collecting SSL certificates from the internet. Then we added um, an HTTP get slash against every IP address that where we find a, a web server on. And you know, we grab the data, we grab the index page, the HTML that comes back, the server headers, and so on, and then we publish the data. Um, same for reverse DNS, so we do a bi-weekly uh, reverse DNS lookup on every IPv4 IP address, um, you know, just put it out there. Might not be that interesting, you know, immediately to you, but if you, like, combine certain data sets and if you look into it, you know, there are definitely some interesting use cases for this sort of data set. Uh, we do forward DNS lookups as well. We compile, like, a huge name list and basically say, you know, give me, like, what is, what is the IP address behind that name? Or, you know, we actually do any lookups which is essentially saying, give me a couple of records, you know, it doesn't matter which type. Um, and yeah, we, we, we have like, I don't know, millions and millions of, of these records, and it's all published, of course. Um, some of this is actually, like the forward DNS data set, I think it's not automatically pu published, so I need, to, I need to get back on that. Uh, okay, we do other SSL certificate sources, not only the, the web server, but we also look at mail servers, um, you know, IMAP and SMTP and so on, and we are adding like more things along the way. And this, again, this stuff is, uh, you know, used for research internally, but also we publish the data so that, you know, anyone here can hopefully use it for some research. Um, we added recently several UDP probes. So we added probes for UPnP, IPMI, uh, NTP with the monlist command, you know, uh, NetBIOS, a couple of other ones. And it has proven to be very interesting to do that and to see, like, what versions are in use out there. I'm going to get in some, into some of these examples uh, now. Just to give you a feeling of what this means in terms of data sizes and, and you know, um, amount of devices that are out there, uh, for 443, so HTTPS, um, we find about 40 million open ports, um, roughly 25 million SSL certs in use at the same time. And this is because a lot of the big, large hosters and you know, Cloudflare and so on, they have basically a million of IPs with the same SSL cert. So um, it's a bit less than open ports. And it's roughly 55 gigabytes of data collected in a little bit less than four hours. And we do this every week, right? And then it's um, reduced and kind of made up for or like processed and then uploaded and published. Um, yeah, for HTTP, it's a little bit bigger. Um, we grab like uh, the HTTP index page, um, results in like a biweekly data set of 220, 230, 40 gigabytes. And, uh, you know, roughly 60, 65 million uh, web servers are in this data set for every uh, two weeks. Reverse DNS, more records, less data. So it's less data again than HTTP, but of course it's on reverse DNS. Around a billion, 1.1 uh, billion devices or IP addresses have a reverse DNS record associated with them. All right. Um, 
let's continue a little bit into the recent findings because, uh, you know, I, I got to be fast today. So recently, uh, one of our guys, John Hart, he looked at um, network address translation port mapping, which is yeah, called NAT PMP. It's a protocol that is, um, it maintains port mappings, mappings on NAT devices. So typically um, used to control like, or, or, or enable certain uh, you know, software or, or devices to talk to others on the, on the internet, map ports uh, from the outside back. So I think this was used for voice of IP or, or Skype, you know, uh, some, other, some other protocols. And over a million of um, devices expose this service on public addresses on the internet. And this is, I mean, our, our assumption or, or like the, our understanding of this is this is used for internal networks like from the inside to control how the network address translation operates and, you know, change its behavior, add some port mappings. But it's actually exposed on a million devices to the internet. So you can use the service from here, right? You can use it remotely, which is interesting because it's not really meant for that. And, you know, it's either um, on these devices probably in deployed incorrectly. It's some misconfiguration. Or it's more likely that they just suffer from vulnerabilities in the implementation. I mean, they're just available even though they shouldn't be, right? And this allows you basically to open ports from the outside to all kinds of internal devices behind the, the router, which you think normally is kind of a firewall for you, right? It, it doesn't allow people from the internet to reach your, like, local iPhone. But actually, you know, due to NAT PMP, we can sort of, like, this is, this is a problem because you can actually reach it. So, yeah, so this is one of the things. Um, this is still ongoing research. Um, I don't believe we have a white paper on this one out yet. But, um, yeah, it's sort of ongoing and it's really interesting. And we're kind of uh, putting it together in a, in a nice form for you to also, um, you know, look at them. MS SQL is another one. Um, Microsoft SQL Server has this UDP port where it gives you metadata about the database server, such as, is it a clustered instance? Is it a single instance? You know, what kind of version is it running? So we send a probe to this port and we get all the uh, version information about these servers. And if you then map that to the vulnerabilities that are known about Microsoft SQL, you will find that there are, you know, 10,000 to up to 40,000 of Microsoft SQL servers that have just, you know, CVE identifiers basically um, for that particular version. And they're just in use and they're on public internet ports, right? So most of these will be immediately compromisable if you use something like Metasploit or something else, which is an issue, right? I mean, this shouldn't be out there anymore, and especially not for CVEs from 2011. I mean, if someone, you know, didn't patch their UPnP from last year, okay, maybe it's, you know, maybe they didn't pay attention to it. But this is really old kind of deployments, and this shouldn't be out there anymore, and I feel bad when I see that this is, you know, we see this so often in our data sets. Um, I looked a little bit at DNS names. Uh, this is probably not so interesting. It's not really a vulnerability, but this is, it, it gives you a picture of what happens or what you look at when you look at this data. I mean, you, you collect data and you look into the actual content, into the, 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 the traffic that you get, into the uh, data that you get, and it's just weird sometimes. Like, there are um, DNS records that don't use the format that is normally, you know, uh, defined in the RFC or something for the server record, for example. Uh, as SRV record, so uh, it's pretty. It's probably hard to read. I shouldn't have used this this font here, but um, yeah, there are just thousands and thousands of these records, and they are not really usable, at least by the standard implementation of clients. So, you know, I'm wondering, like, what is this? Is it a special proprietary protocol? Why do you, do they put it in this record? And it's just sometimes weird. And I hope for some of your ideas on what this stuff means, or for example, why there are uh, what is it? H info. Why are there 750,000 records in our data set? And that is not all, right? It's not exhaustive. It's just our view that we had in our data. Why are there 750,000 host info records that tell you something like this is an IBM PC and it runs Linux? Why is that in a DNS record? I mean, I don't understand. What is it used for? Is it used for nowadays by some application? Is it? I don't know what it is. Um, lots of location records where there's a uh, basically a GPS location assigned with a domain name. I didn't really know that existed. I, I don't even know what it's used for. Oh, I'm, I'm over time already? No. Yes? Okay. I didn't, I didn't notice that. All right. So basically there are a couple of other ones on these. Um, I need to finish up. But um, the, the, the point is, yeah, we have NTP Monlist was, was another one. We also collect data on that one. There are recently, I found remote code execution bugs on more DVR systems that record basically uh, video streams and video streams from cameras. 
So there are just many more of these findings, uh, these problems out there, and we basically need to change the way that we look at this data and we need to improve on fixing and actually patching our systems. I mean, you know this for embedded systems, but it's not only true for embedded systems. All right, let's, let's go, let's skip the live demo. If any of you guys want a live demo on our data and look into it, um, come to me afterwards and we, we get that done. Sorry about that. Um, the data is on scans.io, this URL here. Uh, check out the slide set, visit the webpage. You can just go to the website, download the raw data sets, and we'll uh, soon also have an API and kind of a lookup, a search interface. All right, this is how it looks like, doesn't matter. So the internet is broken, this is my summary slide. Um, yeah, we need, to, we need to tackle this a bit better and we hope that our scanning and our data is one of the tools to actually tackle that problem and actually hopefully improve a little bit on the scale that we're fixing things. All right, so uh, yeah, the ZMAP guys, a couple of references and then thanks for listening. If you have any questions, if you wanna check out the data, please come to me afterwards.